Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us out here on a sort of still snowy and icy night. Um, and welcome to this evening's program on an expansion of the Commons, copyright, Creative Commons, and Wikipedia. Um, we're happy to co-sponsor this event with a number of other DC organizations with the Wikimedia Foundation, with Wikimedia DC, and with the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property here at the Washington College of Law. And I'm representing Creative Commons USA. And really the reason that those organizations are all interested in this question of open content, of copyright law in the public domain, is that they work together to provide access to a shared set of materials for creativity, for learning and authorship that rely on different provisions of the law to, to be accessible. And so I'm gonna give each of those organizations a brief chance to introduce themselves and to talk about ways that you can get involved. Because one of the purposes of this event is to help people uh, expand from what they currently do, whether they work with Creative Commons or with Wikimedia, to sort of see some of the opportunities for connections between those groups. So to start, I'd like to offer um, Michael Carroll a moment to say what uh, the Program and Information Justice does and how the people can get involved. Great, thanks. Good evening. Uh, welcome. Um, so the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property is um, uh, sort of a hybrid uh, organization here at the law school. Part of it is the sort of traditional academic intellectual property program that supports students who have an interest in the field uh, in our, and we have a number of events uh, in which we bring outside speakers or have other sort of student focused events uh, that are um, <clears throat> focused on just promoting the student experience here at, at the Washington College of Law. Uh, in addition, we have externally funded projects that are trying to make change in the world um, and those uh, um, have a public interest focus. So what is it about uh, the public interest in the field of information law that, that needs promoting and how can we do it? So the Creative Commons USA project sits within that field of activity. There are other uh, activities ongoing. We have a survey of user rights around the world in copyright. So there are author's rights and user rights. Uh, fair use is an example of a user right and cataloging how different countries approach the user's rights, where the public domain is, of course, the most robust user right. Um, it's the most complete. Uh, and then there are statutory uh, versions that still give some control back to the user. Um, and so that's us at PIGIP. If for the students, uh, if you want to get involved in some of the activities at PIGIP, we have a number of Dean's Fellow positions that are supporting both the academic program and the grant-funded research activities. Uh, you can talk to Sean Flynn uh, about some of uh, those if, after, the, after the presentation if, you, if you're interested in that. And I think I'm done. Great. Um, and then uh, Sherwin Tsai at Wikimedia Foundation. Hi, yeah. Uh, so I work at the Wikimedia Foundation. We are the nonprofit that uh, hosts and supports uh, Wikipedia, among other projects. So uh, we provide sort of the back-end infrastructure for it, including the technical stuff like hosting and some of the software tools that are used to build it, but also some of the back-end stuff on things like legal, for example. Uh, if uh, somebody uploads something that infringes copyright and a rights holder sends a DMCA takedown notice, uh, we want them not to send it to the individual contributor volunteer who's somewhere somewhere in the world, send it to us instead. Uh, so that's, that's what we do, how people can get involved. Um, Basically, use the tools. Use Wikipedia, use Wikimedia Commons. Also, uh, donate if you can, and uh, donate uh, not just money, but also your time and your skills and your knowledge. Uh, so people editing it, uh, contributing to it, adding to it, uh, if, uh, you know, click on that link and start and go for it. If it looks intimidating, there are resources out there to help you get started doing that stuff. Things online, things in text, but also people. And I think that, that yeah. might segue, segue there. there. <laughs> and so, Thank you. Uh, our last uh, contributing organization is the Wikimedia DC chapter. And uh, Robert Fernandez will tell you a little bit about that. All right. Hi, I'm Robert Fernandez. I'm a professor at Prince George's Community College of Maryland. And I'm on the board of directors of Wikimedia District of Columbia. And that is a volunteer organization. Um, it's an outreach organization. We don't, unlike the foundation, we don't run Wikipedia. Sometimes people come to our events and 
you know, have their complaints about certain things, and we're like, eh, we don't, we don't make the rules. We're an outreach organization. We help institutions and people get involved with Wikipedia. We'll go to small and large um, museums, and historical societies, and encourage them to release their collections um, under Creative Commons or um, stuff that's already in the public domain. We want, we encourage them to upload images, and we help them with that process. And so um, how you can get involved is uh, you can come to one of our events. You don't have to join our organization. You just show up to wikimediadc.org. We've got uh, uh, three to six events going on any given month. We've got a lot of events coming up in February and March. So please come out and join us. There's no commitment. You just, much like here, you just show up, you know, bring your laptop, um, and we'll show you the nuts and bolts. Of, but today we're just going to be talking about things, but at our events will just show you the nuts and bolts of how to start editing Wikipedia yourself. And I just wanted to give a last second shout out to Peter Meyer over here, who's also on our board and helped uh, set up this event. Great, thank you very much. Um, and just to come back uh, to what we're doing here at Creative Commons US, uh, in a way that's sort of roughly parallel to the Wikimedia structure, there's a Creative Commons exists as a nonprofit organization that um, authored the Creative Commons open licenses and acts as a sort of central coordinator, but then there are also uh, national chapters. So um, I'm the public lead for Creative Commons USA, uh, work there with Ethan Snack, um, my colleague here at the law school, and that's a way for people who are interested in supporting the use of open licenses and in the projects in open education and open science that rely on those licenses in doing outreach and education. So if you're interested in getting involved with the Creative Commons organization, um, joining the US chapter is a great way to do that. Um, and you can do so by emailing info at Creative Commons USA or by talking, sorry, creativecommonsusa.org, it's an important part, or by talking to me or Ethan after the event. Um, so to get started uh, on this event about the public domain, I think a, a first place to talk about what the public domain is and sort of how it exists within the copyright law system. And to do that, I'm going to rely on my distinguished colleague, Peter Yazzi, who's a professor of law and was the founder of the program on information justice and intellectual property that Michael earlier, a founder, that Professor Carroll introduced you to. Thank you, Meredith. And I, I get to do, Ooh, thank you again, I get to do a little bit um, with definitions before I, I talk more personally about the public domain, and it's not, uh, it's not a self-defining term by any means. In, in ordinary speech, we sometimes refer to things being in the public domain, and all we really mean, perhaps, is that, is that they, they, they aren't or even aren't capable of being protected by copyright. So sometimes we might say, well, an idea or a mathematical formulation is in the public domain, by which we really mean that that copyright couldn't attach to that. But there's a slightly more technical uh, definition of the public domain, which is that it consists of things that were at one time or could have been protected by copyright, so-called works, because that's the, the copyright jargon for the objects to which copyright protection might attach but for whatever reason aren't, maybe because something went wrong along the way, maybe because somebody decided that they wanted to renounce permanently all and, and forever all their possible rights, or maybe because enough time passed so that the, the thing, the work, the story picture, novel program, computer program, com, com, computer game, whatever it may be, is just too old to be protected. And as I was sort of getting organized for tonight, I, uh, it occurred to me that over my almost 50 years, I guess, as a working copyright lawyer, sometime teacher, sometime practitioner, I have witnessed a whole series of significant inroads on this concept of the public domain. It wasn't long um, after I qualified as a lawyer and started practicing in this area that the Copyright Act of 1976 was enacted and became effective in, of course, 1978. And that took a huge bite 
out of the public domain, largely, although not exclusively, by means of significantly extending the term of copyright for almost all existing and future works. And then, you know, I stuck around, and, and in the early 90s, we moved from a system in which you had to renew your copyrights affirmatively in order to keep them beyond 20 years to a system in which renewal became automatic. And that was an immense raid on the public domain because prior to that, most works, almost all works, statistically speaking, went into the public domain after 20 years, 28 years, because no one cared enough to, to re-up the rights or spend the $25 or whatever it was to do so. And then, in the later 90s, we had the battle over copyright term extension, which led to the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998, the expiration of which is the formal occasion on which we meet today, and a great cause of celebration it is. And I began that celebration privately, uh, almost immediately, uh, very early in the morning on January 1st of 2019, which was the moment at which, after so many years of, of delay and deferral, a regular flow of material into the public domain recommenced. But I haven't wanted to talk about it in public very much for fear that it was all a dream or that it, someone might still leap up and <laughs> clutch it back. And now as January passes, we've reached the midpoint of the month, I feel more and more comfortable. I think we actually have uh, cause for celebration. I don't think it was a dream. And if not, it's actually for reasons we'll talk about is in the course of the panel today, a very big deal. So it's a good time to talk about the public domain. And for me, at least, this is also a good time for two other things. One is some self-critique, which I'm going to offer you in a moment. And the other is some giving of credit where credit is due for others who you might, in this case, I might, um, previously have denied that credit. So let me get started with the, the, the self-critique part. Uh, the first thing that, that's important to say is that in the mid-90s, when this new round of copyright term extension was being bruited, it wasn't a very hot issue. It wasn't a very, uh, uh, it, no, no, no faction coalesced around opposition to copyright term extension. And I wouldn't have, have probably gotten involved myself if it hadn't been for a few very, very heroic outliers of whom the most outstanding was the late Professor Dennis Cargilla of American State of Arizona State University, who decided to take this on as a personal cause at a time when most groups with expertise in the field, including what you might call public interest focusing groups, thought it was too trivial to be concerned about. And when I did get involved, at, uh, largely at Dennis's urging, I, I felt that the cause was important, that the idea, for reasons I'll explain in a moment, that the idea of the public domain was a worthy idea, but I was very pessimistic about it. I, I thought that it was a lost cause, and I thought it was a permanently lost cause. And when I testified in the Senate in whatever it was, 1997, about this, I remember saying um, that, that the, the legislation that was being considered, this 20-year copyright term extension legislation, would, if enacted, represent a down payment on perpetual copyright on the installment plan. I was absolutely convinced that if it happened once, it would happen again and again and again. So I was wrong. 
And it's really, really nice to be able to say that, to be able to say that it turned out that this was not the first of another per series of copyright term extensions, but actually, mm, as it looks now, the beginning of the end. So I need, to, I need to criticize myself for having gotten that wrong, and then I need to, to ask the question with you as to, as to why I, and I think others, made that mistake 20 years ago. And in order to get there, I have to make a second confession, and that is that, as, as many, probably most, perhaps all of you know, the enactment of the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act was followed by a big lawsuit, the, the Eldred litigation, which was led by Larry Lessig and which led, it came eventually to the Supreme Court, a challenge to the constitutionality of the Copyright Term Extension Act on multiple grounds. I think perhaps most prominently or mo most interestingly, perhaps First Amendment grounds. And I was very critical of the decision to invest in that litigation. I felt then that it was it was doomed as a substantive matter, um, which I was correct about, and I felt then that it was also dangerous to allow the Supreme Court to confirm the existence of Congressional, constitutional congressional power in this area. I may not have been correct about that. So that's the second error I made. I was, I, I think I may have, I may have misunderstood in a way the, the ultimate significance of the elder litigation, even though I may, I, I certainly did get the, the legal call right in advance. And now, now, the, my, my act of self-criticism becomes still more delicate because the other thing that I, 20 odd years ago, for, and even more recently than that, that I have always been really skeptical about is, and oh, I hate to say this, but I've got to, the whole rhetoric of the commons. Um, I was never in, in, in those days convinced that this terminology was the best way of explaining to people in general or policymakers in particular, why it was important that people have more rather than less access to information. And part of that stemmed from having in the course of the legislative wars around the Digital Millennium Copyright Act tried out that rhetoric myself on policymakers, and it would, maybe I just didn't know how to do it, but it was always a disaster. I would go into the, some congressional office and say, we're here to defend the commons, and the first question would be, uh, oh, you're a communist, and I would say, no, um, there's a difference between communism, and this happened. More than once, there's a difference between the commons and communism. And then they would say, oh, what's that? And then I would explain that it was a metaphor based on certain practices in 17th century English open field agriculture. Um, and then you could just see you were losing them completely. I mean, it was just, so <laughs> I, I didn't think this was the best tool the best, the best brand, perhaps, is another way of saying it, around which to organize a movement in, in, in favor of public access to, to codified information. I think I was wrong about that, too, in ways that I need to explain in a moment. But in order to explain those, I want to go back to this definition for a moment. I, I gave you a sort of, a sort of a, a one kind of definitional uh, take on the public domain, but but there's another thing that as long as I've been involved in this, which is as long as I've been involved in the field, has also been at work, and that is even if we agree, maybe for purposes of discussion, that we're going to choose of the, of the definitions I offered earlier, the more technical definition, the definition in which the public domain is figured as a lot of things that once were or could have been protected by copyright works but aren't for some reason. There have always been sort of two ways of characterizing the public domain. 
and I became aware of this already in the in in the days when the 1976 Copyright Act was still under discussion, and it's persisted since. One way of thinking about the public domain is as a kind of an an active resource, something that's really good and rich and productive, and that you can you can use and do things with and be 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 creative about which I think is a view that many of us would share. And the other way of thinking about it is as a kind of discard pile, as the, as the, as the sort of the ash heap of copyright history, as the things that for some reason nobody cared enough about to take care of, the, 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 old, the old junk that we're no longer interested in and therefore can afford to regard as unprotected. And if that sounds silly, if that sounds um, obviously inappropriate, all I can tell you is that there was a time when that was a very, very powerful part of the discourse, when the, the, this essentially negative valuation of the public domain was, if not dominant, then at least powerfully competitive with the popular valuation. Um, is it a is it a is it a public asset a positive public asset? Well, perhaps, but it's just as easy to, or was just as easy to, and often ended up instead being characterized as a kind of a kind of negative space, a space of absence rather than of of positive presence. So this is a kind of interesting dualism, and. Here's what I think has happened over the last 20 years, and I think it's been related to all of these topics about which I made the wrong, the wrong calls once upon a time. I think that as a result of m multiple factors at work, general perceptions of the public domain, for general perceptions on the part of people who, who deal either casually or professionally with information as a resource, general perceptions even on the part of policymakers have shifted much more toward the active, positive vision of the public domain and away from the negative perception of the public domain as being a bunch of stuff that's, 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 that's too old or too odd for anyone really to care about that the vision of the public domain as an affirmatively productive space, a resource for creativity, a, a almost a, a prerequisite, for, prerequisite for the efflorescence of contemporary culture has taken hold. And it is in fact, I think, exercises like the persistence with which the elder legislation or the Eldred litigation was pursued, which didn't lead and probably couldn't have led to a good legal outcome, but had a tremendous um, propaganda value that are partly responsible. And I think in the end, simply by insistence over decades, the various organizations that have deployed the idea of the commons in different ways have won out against the the original rhetorical difficulties that I perceived and have turned the idea of the commons into an incredibly important, widely recognized, popular brand for the value, the affirmative value of access to information and uh, in particular for the value of fr free, freely available information as a resource for new creativity. I also think there's been one, or at least one, perhaps others will suggest additional ones, one other consideration that has figured a little bit in this, in this shift in attitude about the value of the public domain, which led in the end last year to it becoming obvious that it, we, Congress could never have passed another copyright term Extension Act. It was it was done. It was finished. The outrage that it would have generated would have been entirely unmanageable. What else may have contributed to the change in attitude that made it in the end, as I could never have foreseen 20 years ago, completely natural for the Congress just to shrug and go ahead without even making a serious effort or entertaining a serious effort 
at extending the right by another 20 years. Well, I think another factor, interestingly, over that same period of time has been the, the, the rise of a, a new dispensation in the field of copyright fair use. One of the results of comprehensive copyright term extension over the years since the 1970s has been increasing pressure in the system on the part of actual or potential users of information, which in turn has led the courts to reimagine, reconstruct, and dramatically expand the coverage of the copyright fair use doctrine. The copyright fair use doctrine, as most or all of you know, isn't equivalent to the public domain. Particular uses of a protected work may be available under fair use, even though other uses are not. But functionally, where the fair use doctrine applies, it is like the public domain. Because to the extent that it applies, it enables the same kind of creative reuse of existing information that the public domain itself does more clearly, more definitively, but not necessarily more powerfully. And as we have come over the last 25 years to appreciate fair use anew, that development too has contributed. I say 25 years, I probably should have said 35 years. Because as it turns out, we have something else to celebrate today, which I was, I was reminded of um, um, earlier today. And that is that today, literally today, the 17th of January is an anniversary and it is the anniversary of the United States Supreme Court decision in the Sony Betamax case. It, and this is the event which wrote the idea of public, public to, of fair use into the, onto the public consciousness and opened up the possibility for, for all of the developments that have happened since. I hope Bob Schwartz, who's here, might in the question period uh, feel moved to talk a little bit more about the significance of that anniversary because he's one of the very few people um, in the room um, who has been involved, was involved, and has been involved in that struggle ever since. So I, I think those of us who have been who have been also fighting for the redefinition of fair use, perhaps because we have no choice given the 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 inroads on the public domain, which I was describing earlier, may also deserve a little credit for having popularized the idea that having a zone or zones in which the, the writ of copyright does not run is good for all of us, good for our culture, good for our economy, good for our souls. So lots to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and next I was hoping, uh, Professor Michael Carroll, he's a professor of copyright here at the law school and one of the founding board members of Creative Commons might talk a little bit about how materials in the public domain and then materials that are openly licensed interact in providing freedom for users and creators. Great. And I, I want to actually pick up because uh, I agree with everything Peter said, including that uh, some of the skepticism around the rhetoric and, and remembering the junk heap, public domain is junk heap. And I think um, part of what's also changed is the internet, um, mm -hmm. that, that there wasn't a constituency for the public domain because you could treat it like a junk heap because what were you gonna do with it? You weren't gonna publish, uh, you weren't a publisher um, Eric Eldred was the plaintiff in that case because his goal was to republish public domain books on the internet, the classic American literature, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, and remember that that case started pre-broadband. We were still in the dial-up internet era. So he was, he was ahead of himself in understanding that the internet as a repository of cultural resources was going to become more important. And we're gonna hear a lot about that from our colleagues to my right um, in a minute, where we're making the value of the public domain 
as an active resource has become much more persuasive in the internet era than it was at the, at the time, at the, at certainly in the mid 90s when those legislative debates were going on. Um, and so Creative Commons was actually born out of the loss of the Eldred uh, litigation. If we can't cut back the, the, the how long copyright lasts, can we create more space for users to make productive reuse? And can we invite authors who disagree with the policy choice that Congress made to make copyright last so long? Can we empower them with a choice to tell the public, actually, I don't need the full suite of copyright that Congress gave me here. I'm giving it back to you. Go, go forth and do something with that. So Creative Commons created a set of licenses that said, even though I own the copyright, um, I'm going to give you permission that you wouldn't otherwise have, and they are public licenses, so you don't have to ask me permission, you don't have to email me. I've marked the work as having this public permission, um, and now it's yours to, to, to use. And there are six different permutations going, ranging from do anything you want with this but, and give me credit, to the most restrictive is copy paste. You can make a non-commercial use, don't make a derivative work, but you can still republish it. Um, and in between there are varieties, including one that's sort of tries to feed this idea of the commons, the share alike uh, or the viral license that says, if you rely on my copyrighted work to create your copyrighted work, you agree to license your copyrighted work under the same terms that mine are, and Sherwin's gonna talk more about that, I think, right, or sure, like. Um, in terms of the public domain, though, conceptually, when we talked about uh, um, Creative Commons, we started with the public domain. My own involvement in the organization, I wanted that to be a more prominent part of what we did, and that, you know, the licensing of stuff that's in copyright was one thing we could do. But the goal was to mark on the internet your use rights in an easy to understand way so that we could activate that use. One of the problems in copyright law is that it's very easy to scare people with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so part of the idea was to create more clarity about your freedom to use because it was marked with a simple little icon and you could link to the, a description of what your freedoms were under that license, and then if you need to see the full legal code, you can do that. Well, we, why not also mark public domain resources? I, one of my disappointments is that we didn't get more of an effort to get librarians and others to help us mark and tag the public domain to make the public domain more visible. And I think Wikimedia Commons is in some ways now starting to perform that role. But, the, but Creative Commons at least created the legal tools to do that. So with respect to the public domain, there are two different tools. One is the CC0 tool, which says, although this work is under copyright, I hereby relinquish that copyright and give it back to you forever and ever. It is now in the public domain. And that proposition has been mentioned by US courts as something that is possible deriving from property law concepts of the ability to abandon or dedicate property rights. It's never really been fully tested, but we created a document that says everything the courts say you need to say to communicate your intention to give up your copyright forever. And there's some great clip art compilations and other people where they don't even want credit. And it's like, here, I'm giving it away. I, I don't even want credit. Um, and then there's a public domain label. So the, the CC0 is a, a legally functional document. If you adopt that, you are giving away rights that you otherwise have. The public domain label is simply a way of marking something that somebody else may well have created, but you're now letting the world know, this is now in the public domain. Time's up, it's yours. That tool should be used with caution because the public domain copyright is varies across the world and the term of copyright varies quite a lot. In Mexico, the term of copyright is the life of the author plus 100 years. So there, it's possible for a work to be at, not protected by copyright in the United States but protected by copyright in some other country. The public domain label should only get used on the internet if it's if, if everywhere, you know, so the old, old stuff. Um, um, 
So, I, I, so the interaction between the public domain and the openly licensed things is, that, as Peter had said, they're both about empowering users to do something. Um, where the public domain, it's yours forever and ever and ever. Uh, I hope <laughs> there's there. The only other thing I would say is the the, the follow-on litigation was the Golan litigation, in mm -hmm. which Congress snatched back works from the U.S. public domain that had fallen into the public domain in the U.S. but were under copyright in Europe. Um, and, and the court again agreed that Congress had that power. I would say in terms of our advocacy work and, and the value of the public domain and the constituency for the public domain, I was troubled in that oral argument. Justice Kennedy put to Golan's counsel, you know, what's wrong here? Why is it, why is Congress restrained from taking thing, putting things back under copyright? And he was asking for a public uh, a positive conception of the public domain. Show me why there are you know are you saying the public has individual legal rights mm. in works that are in the public domain? What's your legal theory for why this these public resources have to remain public resources and can't be reprivatized? And in that moment, in the heat of that moment, the justice did not really get the most, uh, the strongest answer possible. And I think that's partly on us. We have more theoretical work. We have to do more work to really articulate a theory of the public domain that gives it lasting power, because otherwise it's contingent. Um, I agree it's a celebration of, of great moment that the Congress did not decide to continue with the installment plan on copyright term, but it doesn't mean the risk is gone forever. Uh, I think the politics around it have changed. I agree with Peter, but conceptually, if the politics shift on us, we need a good story to tell about the public domain. Um, and so Creative Commons licenses at least, I think also help that in the sense that there's a constituency around users' rights more generally. If authors are trying to empower people with Creative Commons licenses, users are then using those freedoms. If they like openly licensed content, then surely they like the public domain as well. I think that can be part of the argument, but it, 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 the politically, we've, we've still got work to do, even if culturally we're seeing some progress. I'm gonna stop there because there's so much cool stuff I mean, this is all the law, the legal infrastructure around the public domain, but actually using it, actually celebrating the freedoms and making them uh, alive to people, that's what Wikimedia and Wikipedia are doing. So I'm gonna ask Sherwin and Robert to tell us more about why we care. Why do you care? Public domain, hooray, so what? That's a question to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I hope it's a softball. Well, that, then I guess I've got a fairly long answer to that, I guess. Um, it, you it weren't surprised by that question? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I, as I said, um, the Wikimedia Foundation forms the back end for Wikipedia. I usually use that introduction, I say Wikipedia, because people are familiar with Wikipedia. Wikipedia, the one that most of you are probably familiar with, is English Wikipedia. That's one of many, many projects that we have. Uh, with those Wikipedias in different languages, there's uh, you know online free dictionaries, and but the thing that I want to talk about today is Wikimedia Commons, because that is one of these projects that depends so much not upon uh, just the generosity of users to contribute stuff, but also on the public domain. So, Wikimedia Commons is an it's a repository for images, sound files, video files. Uh, that are meant to be used across all of the different Wikipedia projects, or all the different Wikimedia projects. So if you're on a Wikipedia page and there's an image on that article entry, um, more likely than not, that image isn't hosted on Wikipedia or the particular Wikipedia you're on. It's more often hosted on Wikimedia Commons. And the idea behind that is that it's this one place that can provide all of these different uses for things. So. This relies upon works being in the public domain, not upon fair use. Why not? Fair use is wonderful. We are celebrating the, an, an, a major fair use anniversary. Why not fair use? It's because fair use is case specific. It's dependent upon how that work is being used. So if somebody 
has, takes a copy of uh, an image that's under copyright, an, an album cover, for example, uploads that to English Wikipedia, that's very likely a fair use. That's going to be a fair use. When I say very likely, I mean, you know, I say very likely because I don't want people to rely upon legal advice. But that's a fair use. Um, <laughs> It's it's non commercial. Say it loud. <laughs> it's non commercial. It's for educational purposes. It's not interfering with uh, the market for that particular copyrighted work. Um, so that's fine. But what happens if you're a middle school student doing research on this particular artist? Oh, and you want to take that image and you want to use that in something else? Maybe you're going to put it up on a website. Oh, hang on. If you're a student, maybe, and you have to go through that analysis of fair use all over again. It's new use. How are we doing this? If somebody takes that image and wants to use it to advertise their business, ooh, different question. And the idea behind Wikimedia Commons, at least, is to provide a set of things that people can use for whatever purpose they want to, whether it's commercial or not, uh, whether it's educational or not. And for them not to have to worry about specific license terms and specific instances, which is why it relies upon the public domain and upon free licensing. So Creative Commons licenses, uh, if somebody grants, grants something into the public domain under CC0, that's, that's acceptable in, uh, in uh, Wikimedia Commons. If somebody has a Creative Commons attribution license, um, so the license basically, in essence, says, look, you can use this however you want, just make sure you credit the author. Or if it's uh, an attribution share-alike license, where the conditions are, use this however you want, make sure you credit the author, and make sure you, you know, other people can share what you do with this thing as well. Something to note is things in Wikimedia Commons won't include certain types of Creative Commons licenses, like non-commercial. Um, there are Creative Commons licenses that say, hey, you can do whatever you want to with this, make sure you credit the author, and don't use it for commercial purposes. Well, those aren't going to be part of Wikimedia Commons because, again, you don't want people to have to think about and parse, uh, is this commercial or is it not? Just take the thing, use it. There's a thousand different ways that this can be used, a thousand different new, um, you know, new works that can be created. There's new creativity, but also just new uses that don't have to be some grand flourishing, just using the thing and how important that is. Because, you know, if we sort of require everybody to read licenses, to understand these licenses, that relies upon that same fiction that we have, that people read privacy policies on every website, <laughs> that people read the end user license agreement on every single thing. It becomes paralyzing if you actually are going to hold people to that. And so the idea is create this space and curate this space to have something that can be more usable. And it's important to have that set as a default, and what you can and can't do with a particular piece of text, a particular photo, some type of media, some ideas. What you can and can't do with ideas that you see from elsewhere is something that people are constantly worried about. Um, especially when I think people are first learning about copyright, maybe they pick up some little bits of copyright knowledge on the street from scary lawyers. Um, or, or, you know, like sending the threatening takedown notices, or maybe, you know, they're, they're taking the intro to IP. But you start learning things like the fact that uh, under, under the Berne Convention, copyrights don't require formalities. You don't have to register a work in order for there to be, you know, for copyright protection to apply. Oh, okay, so the minute you fix a creative work in a tangible medium of expression, all of these laws and penalties start applying. You also learn, you know, how quickly and how low the bar for creativity can be sometimes. It doesn't have to be some grand new thing. It does have to be original and it has to involve some modicum of creativity, but that modicum is pretty small. So all of these things now have these restrictions on them and there's this, this constant anxiety about what you can and can't use. And that brings me to sort of why the public domain is so important. Because if we talk about defining it, again, you know, when I was st first starting out, you know, I, I run the section 101 in the definitions and, and you know, under Title 17, say, so, okay, well, where's public domain? Oh, it's, it's not defined. 
And we're here talking about, uh, we're here talking about the public domain because as of the beginning of this year, so many things have come into the public domain. And so some people tend to think of it in terms of, yeah, oh, it's things that were in copyright and they are no, now no longer. But I think it's useful to think about the public domain, as, as Peter said, as, the, as all of the different ways in which things are not restricted. It's not just where the term is expired, it's works that were never copyrightable in the first place, works created by the federal government, for example, things that weren't original works of authorship, things created by chance, uh, or works that aren't fixed in a tangible medium of expression. But it's also ideas, it's procedures, processes, systems, concepts, mm -hmm. discoveries, all of these things that don't fit within the very specific narrow confines of copyright law or patent law or trademark law. It is this absence of restrictions that lets creativity in large ways and small ways breathe. And it's, you can create, again, something new and amazing. You can create a work, that, a derivative work out of something in the public domain uh, and something that will inspire and, and beautify the word, world, or you can just use it as a building block for something else. Use a piece of artwork to illustrate something that your business does. And that all of those freedoms, the large ones and the small ones, are all important and all necessary for how we exchange ideas. I do want to address the, the, the issue of junk. Um, I, I did see somebody joking online uh, a little while ago about, you know, if the public domain is so great, why, uh, why do we have a gazillion different uh, versions of Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes stories, including uh, one that just got a 9% uh, score on Rotten Tomatoes recently? Um, you know, as an aside, one reason is, well, if we had more things in the public domain, maybe, you know, we wouldn't have the same producers going back to the same well over and over again for, for the exact same stories. But you know what? More to the point, sure, there's plenty of junk, right? There is lots of stuff that people will create based upon the public domain that's, you know, not great. Um, that happens. There's lots of things that's, that, that, that's in the public domain that maybe you know, we, don't, that we don't love, that we don't appreciate, that we're not ready to share with the world. I think there are some real gems out there, but we'll get to that in a minute. And the thing is, that's fine under the law. We don't want the law, we don't want a bunch of lawyers, we don't want judges to, be, to serve as gatekeepers to what we consider art. Um, in Justice Holmes, in uh, Blystein versus Donald Lithographic Company, right? he said, it would be a dangerous undertaking for persons trained only to the law to constitute themselves final judges of the worth of pictorial illustrations outside of the narrowest and most obvious limits. Now, he was, his point was that the law shouldn't try to parse in each case how worthy a particular work had to be in its artistic value before granting it copyright protection. Now, funny thing is, this actually is part of what leads to the low bar to creativity that starts creating some of this anxiety around. And I, there's certainly some criticism over how this has been interpreted and how far it's gone. But this judicial modesty about what a court will consider art and what it considers worthy also serves to extend the freedoms that we have with creative works. Because that same quote from Justice Holmes was cited in another fair use case in Campbell versus Ake of Rose Music, where Justice Souter was citing it to say, look, we're not going to judge the quality of Two Live Crew's parody of Roy Orbison. We're not gonna say, oh, well, this does sort of incisively get at these particular themes. We're not gonna engage in it. Look, is there a parodic intent? Yes, okay, that's good. We're not music critics and we will move on. So this idea of whether it's junk or not, I think is beside the point, and it's not for us as lawyers uh, to talk about. And I think the same thing is true for the works entering the public domain today. There's, this reminded me of, uh, of this anecdote in the autobiography of William Carlos Williams. Um, he tells a story, fourth hand actually, about uh, this guy who's trying to fundraise for some society. And he tells, in order to raise money, this, this parable. There's two farmers and they have adjacent fields. One of them's a very pious man. And as he's planting, uh, the, 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 the you know, fields have been plowed and furrowed, he takes a seed 
and he plants it. it. With each plant, it says, God bless the good seed. God bless the good seed. His neighbor, on the other hand, grabs giant handfuls of seed, and he says, damn it to hell, damn it to hell, damn it to hell. Now, the guy says, who do you think got the better yield? Who got the better crop? So as we look at the crop of things that are entering the public domain <laughs> for the first time in a long time today, we can find real gems, precious stones that we want to share with the public immediately. We can find bits of raw material that are just ready to be maybe cut, maybe polished, reworked, made into something new. And there's going to be some strange, weird stuff, <laughs> like stuff that maybe people are going to laugh at, things that seem like they're just tossed out into the world carelessly. But those things are also gifts to us. And they're there, not just for us to look at today and try and find some sort of worth in them today, but for every generation that comes after us, too, will have that opportunity and have all of that time to make something with it, to work with it, to make something beautiful, to make something great, or to just talk about it and use it. So, thanks. Thank you, Sherwin. And uh, now I think we're going to talk about what a few of those gems are. What are some of the really interesting, really valuable, maybe really weird stuff that's interesting entering the public domain? And so uh, Robert Fernandez is going to go through a few of those highlights. All right. So um, yeah, that was a great segue there, because uh, I'm reminded of Sturgeon's Law. 90% of everything is crap. And so that's a good thing to keep in mind, but we're gonna focus on the 10%. Um, a lot of us come to these public domain, to become interested in these public domain issues because we're focusing on the legal aspects, the, the policy aspects, the ethical aspects, and a lot of us come to them for the content. Like, here's a text that I need to find, it's out of print, but it's also under copyright, and I, I can't access a copy. Or can I use this in my classroom? What are the rules? And so we struggle with these things, and the public domain is an um, the you know, the rules keeping stuff out of the public domain is an obstacle um, to all of that. So we're going to talk about, and I want to echo everyone's celebratory tone. I'm optimistic as well. I just want to remind everyone that uh, Steamboat Willie has five years before it goes into the public domain, so Disney still has time to try something new. So hopefully uh, they won't, but... Uh, Anyway, so this is the class of 1923. We're gonna start off with literature. Um, here, the most famous thing that is entering the public domain is, of course, Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening. And you might say, well, so what? I mean, I can, uh, I, last year I could have Googled that and it would have come up. So what's the big deal about this entering the public domain? Well, here's one thing that, that makes that important. The composer, Eric Whitaker, um, um, you may have heard of him. He's really popular with all the folks I know who were in high school band and chorus. Um, he set this poem to music. And the Frost Estate said, no, you're not going to do that. And so that kept that work from being created. And hopefully now that work can actually exist and be publicly heard. And so let's look at some other things here. Uh, Cain by Gene Toomer. It's a classic of the Harlem Renaissance. It's short. And I encourage all of you to read that. Um, the Prophet by Kel Gibrain. Um, it's really popular with hipsters and couples. One of my uh, one of my favorite anecdotes is from Bobby Ann Mason's biography of Elvis, where Elvis's girlfriend got him to read The Prophet. So um, anyway, I digress. Um, but there's a lot of great stuff. Um, this is a very fertile period in um, English literature, in particular, English language literature, in particular. Lots of uh, you know modernist experiments, the Harlem Renaissance, E.E. Um, e. Cummings. And so um, how does this, what changes? Because there's going to be a lot of junk that's coming into the public domain. And one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of terrible ebook versions of all of this with misspellings. And they're going to be thrown out there. And the, you know, there's going to be all kinds of typos. But what we're also going to get is Penguin Books is already the first three things on this list. Penguin Books is are, are already planning new editions of them with new introductions, with new footnotes. And so that is a definite benefit to the culture right there. And also, these things can, you know, they'll be in their terrible junky ebook versions, but they'll also be available on Project Gutenberg and any number of other venues where anyone in the world, if they don't have access to a library, they might have a phone and they can bring that up on their phone now and they can have access to these works of art. 
So, and already, you know, people are putting these on Wikipedia. The, the Internet Archive is furiously scanning and putting new books up. So this, um, this is just great for everyone. So let me move on to the next slide, and we'll talk about film here. Um, this was, of course, the golden age of silent comedy. And if you are not familiar with the film Safety Last by Harold Lloyd, if you've never heard of him or it, you're probably familiar with this image or a parody of this image. It's one of the my most iconic um, scenes from early silent cinema. But there's a whole bunch of stuff coming out into the public domain, like three of the most brilliant practitioners of silent comedy, Harold Lloyd, Charlie Chaplin, and Buster Keaton, new stuff that's um, available for us to use and remix into gift form. Um, we've also got uh, a few other things here and there, Scaramouche, which has fallen to obscurity but was once a very popular adventure. And the Ten Commandments, not the one with Charlton Heston, the original version with some guy whose name, unfortunately, I've already forgotten. I tried to remember it for the presentation, but it's already slipped my mind. So yeah, the first version, the Charlton Heston one, will have to wait a little longer. Um, so continuing on, um, and I just want to say I'm enjoying talking about the fun stuff. I don't have to make any legal citations, talk about Supreme Court cases. I just get to talk about, yes, we have no bananas. A novelty song from 1923, which is um, inspired by a Greek fruit vendor, and here's, and um, so, for inspiring this song, he gets repaid by having a racist caricature of him put on the front of this sheet music here. But yes, yes, we have no bananas. The Charleston, which is one of the most iconic and widely um, used, uh, once scandalous, now not so much, um, dances of the 20th century is still under copyright. Now, finally, the music, the original music is in the public domain, and that is the great Josephine Baker there doing the Charleston. Unfortunately, I don't have an animated version of that, but you know, we do what we can. Um, and then some great uh, blues classics, London Calling, which I did not know was originally a music, musical by Noel Coward, no relation to the Clash album. And then of course, classical music, we've got uh, Be Bella Bartok and other composers. And uh, let's see, and in the realm of art, there's of course another, um, fantastically innovative period in art history. We've got Picasso at the height of his powers, Dadaists, Surrealists, Expressionists, um, everyone experimenting with new ways of seeing the world. Um, one of my favorite painters over here, Kandinsky. And then here is a painting that's here in town in the National Gallery of Art. There's Matisse. And um, yeah. so now that we talked about the fun stuff, it's like, well, what, what do we do with this? So let me circle around back to the Wikimedia ecosystem here and see what, uh, what happens when these things enter the public domain and enter the Wikimedia ecosystem. I'll start with Wikidata, which you might not have heard of. That is um, basically, it's called a knowledge base. I, I prefer the phrase metadata repository because that is a little more explanatory, even though it's a thing that I just made up. Um, but yeah, and so the data here is about a painting, as you can see, here's the data about a Kandinsky painting or a person or a book or whatever it is. And it's in there in structured form and it's open, and it's available for anyone to draw on. The Google Knowledge Graph pulls a lot of its information from um, here. Uh, Wiki, Wikipedia articles will pull information from here. Any, you could write a program that will pull information from here. And um, it's just some of the things that, um, and Wikidata links to a whole, like I said, an ecosystem of projects. On the top there, you can see all the, um, the articles on this topic in every single language of Wikipedia. And some of these, this only has three. There are some that have 50 over 100 because there are 300, a, a little less than 300 different language version Wikipedias. There's um, some in you know, Native American languages. There's one in Klingon. Um, but of course, the biggest ones are you know, English, French, Chinese, and so forth. Um, and then the picture, um, which is hosted on Wikimedia Commons, and I'll circle back to that in a second. And then links to other Wikidata items for the creator, the museum, et cetera. Um, now down here are the identifiers where it links to external databases. It's all part of this web of open, open data. And so here, just two examples are, um, it links to VIAF, the Virtual International Authority File, and it also links back to the museum, which is, I think, the Pompidou Center in this particular case. 
Now, on the next slide here, this is what Wikimedia Commons look like. This is, um, as Sherwin said earlier, these images are not hosted on Wikipedia 99% of the time. They're hosted on Wikimedia Commons. And from there, all the other language Wikipedias and all the Wikimedia projects draw the image from. So you can see on the right, that is that particular image being used in the article on English Wikipedia. But where it's actually stored is on the left on Wikimedia Commons. Now that's the Kandinsky article. I just added that uh, picture to there today. And if you scroll to the bottom of the Kandinsky article, it links to some other projects which are also full of free material. Uh, Wikimedia Commons, we talked about earlier, Wikiquote and Wikisource. Wikisource I wanted to focus on in particular because there are a lot of works of literature that are entering the public domain. And this is one of the places that they can end up is on Wikisource. A Wikisource where volunteers try to make the book as, as accurate and as close to the original as possible. You can see they're trying to mimic the font sizes and types of the original printing and they include the original illustrations. And then there's also line numbers to help you navigate. And so, and also a lot of them, and here's an example, a lot of them will have scans of the original book. So you can, you know, do a one-on-one -on -one comparison, you can proofread, you can annotate them, you can link them to other free projects, link them to Wikipedia articles, link them to definitions in Wiktionary. And so there's all kinds of ways, so participating in the free content ecosystem here, um, it's not just about writing a Wikipedia article about something. There are many ways you can contribute. You can upload a picture, you can, you know, improve, if you know Photoshop, you can improve a grainy picture and um, take some distortions out of it. You can annotate a book in a wiki source. You can, if you're really into metadata, and maybe I'm the only one here who is, you can go on Wikidata and um, play around with that. But, um, you know, Wikipedia is, of course, not only the world's largest information source, but it's the largest source of Creative Commons content in the world. And so we encourage you to participate, and it's very exciting that all of these things are now available, not just to Wikipedia and Wikimedia projects, but to the entire world. And thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, and probably for the most exciting part of the talk, we get to see the things actually entering the public domain. Um, so I'll talk a, a little bit briefly about how, in the ways that we've talked earlier, there's this effort to think about what is the constituency for the public domain and sort of what are the ways in which it's valuable to people and it's sort of used out there in the wild? And we've also talked a little bit about the um, relationship between Creative Commons licenses, fair use content, and content in the public domain. And as one example of an area where this is being used by people who want to do their thing, who aren't partisans for Creative Commons licenses or fair use or the public domain, but to whom it really matters is the open educational resources community. So a lot of what we've done at CCUS is work with teachers and authors who have said, wait a second, we really want to have control over the materials we're using in our classroom, and we don't want to spend money year after year purchasing content from big publishers that we can't change, we can't correct, we can't update, and that doesn't fit our teaching purpose. And that endeavor, I think, is one that really illustrates how each of these areas of focus that we care about, about the, the power of fair use to allow specific uses, even of content that is current and covered by copyright and without the permission of the rights holder. And then separately, the Creative Commons licenses and endeavors I think of which Wikipedia is the most powerful. Well, people have said, I intentionally am taking my time and my expertise and making something new that I intend to be open from the beginning. And then the public domain in this content that is continually created as content expires, well, recontinually, I guess we had this brief break in that, but this growing pool of content that can be used in any context and for any purpose are combined in, in a single thing. And so I think a great example of this is that, you know, regularly when teachers sit down to a subject, their, their first idea is, okay, I'm gonna write this from scratch. 
And in early areas of open education, a lot of work was focused on topics like uh, math or science, where that's relatively easy. You can sit down, and it may be wasteful or duplicative, but you can write a algebra textbook from scratch. And to the degree that you rely on other things, you rely on the things like ideas that we have talked about as not being protected by copyright. But as this community of OER authors and practitioners has expanded, you run into these insurmountable limits to what you can create from scratch. You know, if you are writing a history textbook, you cannot, there are no new photographs of World War II, right? Those have all been taken. We're not making new ones. And so if you need to use those, your choices then become either things in the public domain or things used under fair use or whatever your national law limitations and exceptions for teaching or research permit. And at the same time, fair use, while powerful, is limited. And we see that when teachers want to have full stories and books and primary source material, there is also this real demand for materials in which they don't have to make the fair use considerations and where it is in some cases probably not possible to make a fair use argument for that. And so I think when we think about how to go forward and build the constituency for the public domain or for um, strong and robust limitations and exceptions to copyright like fair use, we have to start in a lot of times by looking at outside of the people who already care about that to people who care about education or care about silent film. Not me, but there are lots of people who do. And we have to meet the people on the issues in which they are really passionate about that thing and talk about how the value of the public domain or how the value of fair use serves their purpose and not just how you convince them to care about the meets and bounds of copyright law for its own sake. Um, so I hope to keep my part brief, so I'll stop there so we have time for some discussion. We might let, you know, so I say we'd let each uh, panelist sort of briefly comment on each other, but I'd ask everybody to try to keep that to just one or two minutes to sort of respond to whatever sparked your attention so that we have chance for the audience to join yeah. in and participate. We've got about uh, 15 more minutes here, and then we'll have a reception where you can go up and really make your opinion known over a snack and a drink. Yeah, there's some, um, I just wanted to say that you made a very important point. There's no new photographs being taken. So there's a huge gap, not just on Wikipedia, but but it affects people who are writing textbooks, and open educational resources. There's a gap between 1923 and the present. Now, if you want a picture of something, like a Wikipedia volunteer like Jim, will go take a picture of it and put it on Wikipedia. And if, you, if it's older than 1923, you just grab a picture and throw it up there. But in between, there's a whole huge chunk of human history that is under copyright that there's almost no images of. That, um, and that's a huge, huge problem for, for education and any number of things. I agree, thank you. I don't want to leave that hanging. Uh, you know, I don't think I have a, a lot to add. Uh, I, I did want to just note, I think one of the things that I was super interested to see was all these modernists, right? Modernism is something that's coming up in, in you know, around the turn of the 20th century into the early 20th century. And in modernist poetry, for example, you're starting to see, I don't know if they, I wouldn't say that they invented it, but you're starting to see them starting to popularize and really use uh, this idea of remix and grabbing bits of what was considered low culture and bringing them in. And now that's coming up again to be, uh, to sort of be recycled into the public domain. And that's really exciting. I think it's really ironic that like, because of that, like T.S. Eliot, I saw you looking at his Wikipedia article. <laughs> um, he's one of the biggest practitioners of, of that. And one of, I saw an English textbook once that I was looking at to evaluate for, for a course. And it said basically, yeah, the wasteland is really important and we were gonna put it here, but we couldn't afford it, so go read it somewhere else. This the, content is not available in your yeah. country. There's a very nice, absolutely brand new book by Bob Spoo with the uh, title Copyright and Modernism, which is well, well worth looking at because it explores multiple dimensions. You know, it's interesting that you were talking earlier, Sherwin, about Williams, because of course, um, the first collected volume of Williams' poems, from which comes, among other things, the, the Red Wheelbarrow, was published in 1923. <laughs> I, 
I want to hear from the audience. You've been very patient. Thank you. And there's a switch on the microphone. Thank yeah. you. I think this is a command performance. But anyway, yeah. P Peter's theme was Who's Sorry Now? <laughs> <laughs> It happens to be my favorite 1923 song oh. now entering the public domain. But I think he's a little hard on himself, as are the rest of us, because I just checked these dates on Wikipedia. Uh, the Sonny Bono Act was passed October 7th, 1998. The Conference Committee on the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, was October 8th. And we were all working together in the Digital Future Coalition. And there was a lot of stuff on the table. It was busy. At yes. that time. Uh, we had what became Section 512. We had technical measures in 1201. And uh, you know, as it, it turned out, a lot of folks in content are, are sorry now about how 512 turned out. And a lot of folks uh, are sorry about how 1201 turned out. But that's what happened. But uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the head of my client at the time, the Home Recording Rights Coalition, Gary Shapiro, who's uh, the head of CTA, has said that his biggest regret in his entire public policy career was not doing more to mm -hmm. try to stop the uh, Sonny Bono Term Extension Act. Um, it's just that there wasn't any money uh, behind it at the time, and public interest groups to, you know, were, were not set up and focused the way they are now, and they had th those that we had had uh, a lot to worry about. Uh, and as, as far as the the internet, uh, you know, b being the the, the anniversary uh, of the Betamax. Case. Nowadays, we find out about uh, Supreme Court decisions, uh, you know, through the internet. Uh, I can remember uh, sitting in the, and I mentioned this in a Slate article I did five years ago today, uh, sitting in the hallways of the Supreme Court with the lawyers for the entertainment industry, waiting to see if it came down that day, oh because my. that was the only way to find out and then make a call, okay, press release number 3C, I think we won, you know. <laughs> uh, but, a, a, and as Michael mentioned, you know, just looking at, at the way all of this has changed attitudes, yesterday some of us um, were at the Library of Congress where the Copyright Office itself put on an hour and a half excellent uh, celebration of the public domain, and uh, it's it's on their website. If you go to Copyright Office, public domain celebration, click on event, uh, the thing is, was streamed and, and it's archived and with, you know, due celebration of public domain material as a resource. Now, again, back in the day, <laughs> can you imagine our dear friend Ralph Ullman <laughs> heading the Copyright <laughs> Office doing that, or even Mary Beth or Peters? Mary or, Beth. So, uh, you know, I, I think everybody in this crowd can feel good about this, you know, about what's been done to change perspectives all around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other uh, questions? Quick question. I don't know. Oh, so we did, we are web so webcast. If you just come up and be heard, yeah. Please do. I know it doesn't sound like it, but I appreciate it. It's it's um recorded even though it's not amplified. about the shift in public perception with public domain. And so in my realm, it's open access movement and working with research universities. I see that shift happening with that as well, access to scholarship. But my question is actually about open licenses and some of the, the public perception and research pers perspective in terms of open licenses and using them. Um, some fear, some thinking, someone's going to use my work incorrectly. Uh, researchers asking why it matters that they have their own copyright. So could you respond to how might somebody practically address that? How might you start a culture shift on a campus for example? I can talk a little about the sort of fear of bad use and then Michael if you want to talk about the OA part more generally. Sure. So 
I spend a lot of time talking about the issue of what if licenses let bad people do bad stuff with your content? And in the educational con context, there's this worry that like irresponsible people are going to edit your things and make them bad. Um, that has not been our experience, like just from a data standpoint. That the idea that someone is, you know, malfeasant enough that they're gonna wanna come in and edit bad stuff into your textbook but rule following enough that they'll only do it if it's openly licensed just hasn't been the deal, right? And I've had a question of like, isn't this going to encourage like copy shops in countries where people are just taking textbooks to copy shops? And the answer is like, well, but, but they're taking text. You like, you know, you have this sort of problem of like, if you already do it with a copyrighted version, you're not gonna be more liberated to do it with the openly licensed version. Um, and that's not the most encouraging thing to tell people that just like, don't be afraid, it won't help you anyway. Um, so I think the thing you have to say is we don't see that. But what we do see time after time is that if you've made something valuable and you put it out under an open license so that other smart, well-intentioned people can do something new that you didn't think about with your valuable thing, that that's what you have to focus on. You have to focus on the idea that if you put all this energy into creating something that is good and valuable, you have to believe that what other people are gonna do is they're gonna have new, interesting, valuable ideas about what to do with it, and you have to focus on the upside, not the down. And I think you can honestly say we don't see situations in which people do intentionally bad things because of license. Sometimes people do stuff that you didn't want, like people do use it in a way that you think is commercially exploitative in a way you didn't want, but you don't, we really don't see the sort of trickster, bad-intentioned actor using open licenses. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Can, and can I ask, are you thinking more about monograph authors or, or journal articles? Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, so look, it's a, it's, there's a natural, there's a natural, I mean, I don't think copyright uh, is to, uh, we'd probably have this desire for control that you, you encounter in these conversations with or without copyright. There is this idea of it's my work and I wanna control the way I'm being presented and my ideas are being received. Um, and I agree with Meredith that there is this idea that the license is suddenly gonna change other people's behavior and we just haven't seen that. Um, so you often have to get on the table what the, what the nightmare, what's the monster under the bed that they're imagining and then the other thing is legally, in some of my, these conversations, historians, for example, are particularly, I don't just want to, I don't want credit, I want the other more restrictive uh, terms because I'm worried about basically having someone use the freedom of the license to do something that would be academically reprehensible. Like a senior scholar will take the thesis of a junior scholar and because they only have to give attribution but don't have to be as specific about what they did, I can take 95% of somebody else's openly licensed monograph, throw 5% of my content around it and call it my own. Well, even if that's not an infringement of copyright, that's plagiarism, <laughs> that's, you know, there are other constraints on the bad behavior other than copyright. Um, and so it is both the copyright's not gonna do all the work that you think it will uh, the other one is don't quote me out of context. Well, fair use is gonna let you, that, you know, fair use is not gonna, uh, is gonna permit that as well. So I think there's a, the, it is a control impulse. And so I think to Meredith's point, it is the bad things that you are imagining are happening are products of a fertile imagination that as a scholar, we, we recognize that's a good attribute, um, but the evidence is not, doesn't support it. There are, um, if someone was a bad actor, the open license is unlikely to be the thing, the cause. Um, and to the extent that there are people who would be tempted to do the acts that you're thinking of, there are likely other constraints on those behaviors other than copyright that are still active in doing the work. And therefore, there's, it is not your only source of control and your only source of protection in the academic sphere if there's misbehavior. And I, I would add to that that there is some evidence, on, on the other hand, that offering 
scholarly publications, in particular journal articles, on the basis of some kind of open licensing substantially increases their reach. And increasingly, we are going to see in the academy uh, scholars being assessed, evaluated, promoted, and otherwise rewarded for the reach of their scholarship rather than for the, the, the prestige title of the publication in which they publish that no one actually reads. Now, yet, like, it's the version on SSRN that everyone reads, right? <laughs> It's just the one that everybody gets to first. Yeah, I mean, everyone's saying like a more eloquent version of what I was gonna say, like no one's gonna cite you if they can't read your paper. Um, and just, and you correct me if you know the figure, but I think 40%, like a paper is more, 40% more likely to be cited on Wikipedia if it's open access, something like that. And that's, you know, a huge reach if you're cited in a Wikipedia article there, you're all over Google. Or you... Yep, and I raise SSRN just as an example of something that it's out there, right? It's not necessary, it's not going to be, and the question is, what happens when that becomes much more restrictive? Then does that, does that, um, that no longer becomes what it was used for by scholars? And then you have other avenues. <laughs> so I think we have time for maybe one or two final questions, um, but I wanted to see anyone else who wanted to, comments as well? the metaphor of the commons, because of the analogy to the village commons, it's so obscure. That's also what I thought. I don't really care. Did I understand that you preferred a, a language of public access? And anyone can comment? I, I think that's right. I mean, I don't, I don't want to pretend that I ever had a, an, a, a, a solution to the question of the best, the best metaphor or the, the best rhetoric but I, I, always, I felt then that one that was less obscurely referential and more clear on its face might be effective based on the limited but very discouraging experiences that I had trying to do face-to-face -face persuasion of policymakers using the commons rhetoric. Uh, as it is, I think it's triumphed and I'm perfectly happy and satisfied with it now, and we will never know whether we might have moved faster and, and, and further if we had chosen something a little less, uh, a little less um, sort of geeky to begin with. And, and maybe part of the point is that some of these metaphors take time to take root. Exactly. Um, so um, people break ground with those metaphors and they understand that, no, it doesn't mean communism. We're talking about like a village green. And I don't know what the Village Green is. But <laughs> you're it's a great album. No, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you ta will you? I mean, it's an important metaphor, but you should tailor your uh, message for the audience. And you have a different audience. You know, we have a, we'll have a different metaphor, a different message for this audience. And then you might want to, you know, dumb it down a little for children and people in the Senate. And you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that's a sort of a festive note to end on. Um, I want to thank everybody very much for coming out. And I really would like to encourage um, in the reception afterwards to, to really use this as an opportunity to help build some of the bridges between uh, Wikimedia folks who are here, people from the law school, people from Creative Commons. So please do introduce yourself. And we have one more person who would you'd like to say hi and introduce. Not a question, just um, something that will hopefully uh, uh, encourage you to come out to some of our events. My name is Ariel Citron. I'm the Institutional Partnerships Manager for Wikimedia DC. I work closely with Rob um, and Jamie's back there and um, Peter and a few other people and Jim. Um, we do have a number of events coming up. As Rob said, I'm going to leave some of my cards on the desk. We are always looking for new institutional partners. If you have connections at organizations, institutions, um, government or otherwise, um, <laughs> please feel free to contact me. Um, we'd love, if you have anything in um, that uh, organizations uh, with collections, of course, we'd love to discuss um, getting those on uh, Wikimedia Commons with you. But I will, we do have an event this Saturday. If you'd like to learn how to edit and upload images to Wikimedia Commons, it's at the Charles Sumner School. Um, it's a, an archive and museum um, that celebrates the history of uh, DC public schools. We do also have a couple events coming up at the Baltimore Museum of Industry and a few um, events at the National Gallery. 
Um, unfortunately, we had to cancel or postpone um, <laughs> one of our events that was being um, held at the Belmont Paul uh, National uh, Park Service site that will be rescheduled. So please, uh, I encourage you again to check our website. Um, and uh, we have about 40 to 45 events a year. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone.